Ever seen rivers that start not from the mountains, but from the sea? Yep, you can actually see that in Saudi Arabia. What's more, the rivers here flow straight into the mountains, reaching heights close to 10,000 feet. Yes, Saudi Arabia is home to countless grand projects, some of which might never see the light of day, but this one is different. The project we just mentioned isn't just a concept anymore, it's already making a massive impact on the country. It provides billions of gallons of water to people in need and helps create green spaces amidst endless sandy deserts. You could say this project is a real lifesaver for Saudi Arabia. Actually, Saudi Arabia's made great strides in producing drinking water lately, and it's no surprise because the country doesn't really have a choice. People need water to drink, and crops need it too. But where do you get it when the state is literally right here? Do you see anything besides sand and mountain ridges on the western coast of the peninsula? There's really nothing, not even any water sources like rivers or lakes. There isn't a single permanent river in Saudi Arabia. And there aren't any real lakes either, only man-made ones or dry ones. As for the climate, you know how the hotter it gets, the thirstier you feel? Well, it's hot here, really hot. Daytime temperatures can hit 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and since Saudi Arabia is pretty much one big desert, nights here are chilly. But that doesn't mean the country needs any less water. Rainfall is also pretty scarce around here. So what's the bottom line? You need to drink, and you need to grow crops. But you can't get drinking water from the most obvious places. It just so happened that Saudi Arabia is in a region with zero traditional water sources, so they started getting water from less obvious places. For example, from underground, or more precisely from aquifers, that is, you could say subsurface reservoirs of water. The Saudis figured out the potential of this option long ago. But they only started actively extracting fresh water in the 1980s, and that's when there was an agricultural boom. The government drilled hundreds, maybe even thousands of wells tapping into water that had been locked underground for ages. Green circles like these started popping up along with other plants. Yep, right in the middle of the desert. It's an incredible view that can really throw your mind for a loop. The consumption of groundwater was growing at an incredible rate. After the active start of use in the 80s, water extraction in 1990 reached 6.3 trillion gallons. And in 1992, it shot up even higher, hitting 7.5 trillion gallons. There was an overwhelming amount of water, and until 1994, it was even free for household use. Still, these needs consumed much less than agriculture, so their losses were minimal. However, starting in 1994, a moderate tariff was introduced, but all this abundance didn't last long. Information started coming out that, actually, consumption is so high that these shallow water aquifers can't replenish themselves from the rain which is already quite scarce in Saudi Arabia, and the deep aquifers don't have the ability to regenerate because, well, they're just deep and no precipitation reaches them. By 2008, according to experts, Saudi Arabia was close to using up to 106 trillion gallons of groundwater. At the beginning of active agricultural development, the amount of groundwater resources in the country reached 132 trillion gallons. In other words, by the end of the 2000s, the Saudis had literally used up nearly everything beneath their feet. To avoid totally running out of valuable underground water, Saudi Arabia's authorities, for example, launched a program aimed at radically cutting water usage. Under the program, the ministry ordered cutting daily water use per person down to 40 gallons by 2030. Moreover, the government cut down on water usage in agriculture by introducing a bunch of technologies that save this precious resource and simply by reducing crop farming. As a result, by 2020, the country as a whole used 4 trillion gallons of water, which is an incredible difference compared to the 6.5 trillion gallons agriculture alone consumed back in 2015. By the way, even though this was a significant drop in water usage, in 2020, each person in the country was still using about 321 gallons a day. And that, let's say, is no small amount considering it's roughly the same as what one person in France uses daily right now. Saudi Arabia is truly impressive in its ability to produce water under such tough conditions. By 2020, the country had really managed to slow down its use of its main water source, aquifers, but there was still more work to do. So Saudi Arabia came up with something else. The country decided to use salty seawater, which helps reduce dependence on its ever-shrinking underground reserves. You know how much seawater Saudi Arabia is desalinating these days? 3 billion gallons a day. If that number doesn't blow you away, that's 55% of the entire Persian Gulf region. If you're still not impressed, know that it's 22.2% of all the desalinated water in the world. 
In this field, the country has left its competitors far behind. It's the world's number one transformer of seawater into drinkable water. It's important to point out that back in 2015, all the desalination plants in Saudi Arabia together produced 1.6 billion gallons per day, meaning that by 2024, their output is almost doubled. Today, 41 desalination stations are working to ensure the country has drinkable water. All of them are really important for the country because, as we've already mentioned, the plants produce 3 billion gallons of drinking water per day. Each of them is like a whole factory, taking care of collecting, treating, and delivering water, and many of them also double as power generators. For example, the Ross Hall Care plant produces 2,400 megawatts of electricity. Sure, that's hardly impressive on its own, but on the other hand, it's the world's largest desalination facility, churning out more than 264 million gallons of drinking water daily. Still, the energy bonus is a great perk because it powers the plant itself and the nearby factory. If you're wondering how stations can generate electricity at all, the simple answer is in one word, steam. The thing is, most of the desalination plants in Saudi Arabia turn salty water into drinkable water using multi-stage instant distillation or multi-effect distillation. The first method involves heating seawater, after which it evaporates in several stages under gradually decreasing pressure, then the steam is condensed into fresh water. The second method isn't much different. It creates the same steam from which drinking water is then produced. However, in this case, horizontal pipes and the pressure of the steam are used. With either of these methods, the steam can be converted into electricity, something the Saudis are successfully doing. By the way, the same Ross All Care station doesn't just desalinate through evaporation. The station is hybrid, so it includes eight steam units and 17 reverse osmosis units. There's no steam here. There's a pump that pushes salty water through a membrane, so the salt stays behind and the drinkable water comes out of the system. What's interesting is that the working principle is copied from our bodies. Inside us, there's a process called osmosis, which tries to balance the salt concentration inside and outside the cell. Reverse osmosis is becoming so popular that the Saudis are planning to switch all their power generation plants to it. Why? One high-ranking official says it'll help achieve the goal of reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2060. This connection between the drive to reduce carbon emissions and desalination plants doesn't end here. In 2023, ACWA Power, in partnership with Gulf Investment Corporation and Abawani Water & Power, launched a desalination facility that provides 20% of its energy needs from solar power. The plant, with a production capacity of 158 million gallons of desalinated water per day, has achieved a record efficiency of 2.8 kilowatt hours per 264 gallons. While one such station is just a drop in the ocean, a few of these could really mean a bright future for Saudi Arabia. The Saline Water Conversion Corporation runs most of the country's desalination and power plants and is the state authority responsible for all the water in Saudi Arabia. And they're aiming to cut carbon emissions by a whopping 37 million tons just by ditching traditional systems for solar-powered ones. So by riding this solar and desalination trend, the country will eventually become less dependent on underground water sources and oil in the future. Yeah, desalination plants are still mainly powered by oil for now. But there's one big issue with this whole desalination expansion. Here it is. Plain as day on the map. This is the infrastructure for transferring desalinated water, and it's not even enough to provide drinking water for everyone in the main parts of the country. Obviously, drinking water goes to Riyadh first, it's the capital after all. Naturally, water also goes to Mecca, the jewel of the Islamic world. But plenty of smaller settlements as well as fairly large remote cities are still limited in their choice of drinking sources. On top of that, Saudi Arabia's population keeps growing. That means more water is needed, and this, in turn, means the existing pipeline system has to be upgraded to handle more capacity. Back in 2010, 5,220,000 people lived in Riyadh, but by 2024, the population has already grown to 7,821,000. On top of that, it's expected that by 2035, the city's projected to cross the 9 million mark. But you didn't really think Saudi Arabia, with all its endless megaprojects, wouldn't be able to solve this problem, did you? To transport desalinated seawater, the Saline Water Conversion Corporation has laid out its own network of rivers across Saudi Arabia that stretch through deserts, plains, and even climb to an altitude of 9,186 feet, cutting through mountains. Of course, these aren't literal rivers. The company built a pipeline system. But given the scale of the whole project, calling these pipes rivers feels pretty spot on. 
By the way, everyone knows about the Nile, right? It's the second longest river in the world, stretching 4,130 miles and providing water to millions of people across African countries. Well, the artificial river created by the Saline Water Conversion Corporation is 8,820 miles long, more than twice as long as the Nile. If this pipeline system were an actual river, it would have made it into the Guinness World Records. Actually, hold on, it's already there. The Saudi Pipeline Network is the largest water distribution system in the world. The bold claims about the system don't stop there. The total length of the entire distribution network is over 80,000 miles, and the collection network spans more than 31,000 miles. That's enough pipes to wrap around our planet several times. How does it all work? First, the water goes through pretreatment, then it's filtered. Ideally, that would mean reverse osmosis, but since not all stations are upgraded yet, it could also be an evaporative desalination system. After that, the water goes through post-treatment and ends up in storage tanks. And yes, the Saline Water Conversion Corporation earned its place in the Guinness World Records not only for the largest pipeline system, but also for building the world's largest covered drinking water storage. It's located in Riyadh and holds nearly 1.3 billion gallons. From this reservoir, water flows through the main pipelines, let's say the big channel of an artificial river, and then goes through smaller branches to the necessary places. How much water can the pipeline system deliver from the desalination plants to reservoirs or directly to the needed locations? 5 billion gallons of clean drinking water per day. It's tough to say how much effort and time went into the construction because the Saline Water Conversion Corporation doesn't share the data, but there was definitely nothing easy about the whole process. Laying pipes, that's one thing. Even massive main pipelines aren't an issue. But getting all that over mountains, that's definitely quite an accomplishment. By the way, why does Saudi Arabia's achievement look like this? Why couldn't they set up a system of canals like the one in Saudi Arabia from ancient times? First of all, laying pipes is just easier and faster because you need to do a lot less digging. Second, it's about the climate. The scorching sun and high temperatures, as we've already mentioned, really don't get along with water because unfortunately it evaporates. And third, along the way to the destination, literally anything can get into the water. And whatever that is, it's unlikely to be something people who'll be using this precious resource will appreciate. Anyway, pipelines are really effective. Plus, they're much easier to lay down than a channel system. However, they seem like a simple solution when compared to something else. As a standalone project, this whole pipe system is very complex. But humanity has long had a way to get rid of the need to lay pipes, and Saudi Arabia is actively using it right now. Here it is, floating across the sea. This is a floating plant that was launched in 2022. It can float to any coastal area that needs drinking water and provide 13,200,000 gallons per day. If that's not enough, two more of the same kind can arrive. All of them are part of a project by Bari, which is partnering with, can you guess who? Of course, the already familiar Saline Water Conversion Corporation. This is a guarantee of success, judging by the initiatives of the company we learned about today. On top of that, success is further ensured by the fact that the creators openly state each floating desalination plant will support all the necessary innovations, localization of the latest technologies, expansion of capabilities, and also provide job opportunities for young people. And hey, it must be pretty cool to float on something like this. By the way, remember we mentioned at the very beginning that Saudi Arabia is a country of mega projects? I'm sure many have heard of one of them called Neom. If not, here's a quick overview. In 2017, the crown prince of the country, Mohammed bin Salman al Saud, decided to create a city district in the Tabuk province, covering an area of 10,230 square miles, which was meant to be one huge project that includes a number of smaller mega projects. According to the plan, it's supposed to create 460,000 jobs and add $48 billion to the country's GDP. However, there are a lot of issues, from crazy aspirations to more practical problems, so the goal of finishing it by 2039 seems very questionable. Anyway, for Neom, they were planning to build a desalination plant in Oxagon, one of the megaprojects within the megaproject. The plant's not only designed to produce up to 528 million gallons of drinking water per day, but it was also developed with a lot of innovative technologies. We won't talk about using 100% renewable energy, that's obvious, because Saudi Arabia is actively working on reducing emissions. What's really interesting is that the desalination plant was planned to be equipped with cutting-edge membrane technology to produce separate brine streams. 
This would allow for developing and monetizing the production of products derived from the brine. The plan involved processing brine into industrial materials for local use or export abroad, and the main area where it can be applied is industries that use high-purity industrial salt, bromine, boron, potassium, gypsum, magnesium, and rare metal feedstocks. Once again, something went wrong with Neom. At one point, the companies involved in the development of the desalination plant announced that Neom's water needs had changed over the past year, which required a change in strategy. To put it simply, the companies decided to end the agreement for joint development of the desalination plant. They haven't even started building the plant yet, and there's no real need for it at the moment since Neom's still far from done. However, this was the first instance when a megaproject actually canceled the plans that were part of it.